A picturesque blue water harbor, tranquil and idyllic, the gentle nutmeg scent of tropical breezes. But soon the island of Grenada would find itself embroiled in a struggle to preserve the rights and freedom of its people. By October 1983, the threat of communism ran rampant. Virtually every wall carried a revolutionary slogan. The suffocating presence of Fidel Castro, North Korea, and the Soviet Union would only be fully realized after the successful intervention of the United States. The hidden stronghold of captured Soviet weapons and documents would be the final proof that this threat was real. The six total warehouses, this complex looks like a large storage and, and uh, distribution center. We'll see the uh, shipping cartons, which show that the, the destiny or the origin of these weapons were either Cuba or, or uh, the Soviet Union. A supply house for terrorists. There are obviously more weapons here than what can be used by a small local defense force on this island. Obviously a distribution point. AK-47. Other weapons found among the AK-47 assault rifles included mortars and rocket-propelled grenades. After the success of Operation Urgent Fury, the Grenadian citizens would express gratitude for the American intervention, secure in the knowledge that these weapons would never be used against their own people. Banana clip. I appreciate having you out of it. It was in the The Americans. We would have been having a hard time in Grenada. Americans more or less had stopped them from coming in because they wanted the Grenadian to be free, free from Communism and socialism. The invasion is very yes, good. Very nice. Look, God has sent you all, you know. God has sent you all to deliver some communism and things like that. But I do not mean sell to the Russians and the Cubans. Good thing you guys come, man. We've been in real trouble here, man. Grenada, a friendly Caribbean island whose people enjoy an easy, simple life free from a hectic pace. But on October 19th, 1983, what should have been a normal afternoon of fishing and everyday tasks erupted into violence when Grenada's Prime Minister, Maurice Bishop, and over 250 civilians were brutally executed. The popular bishop, who received his law degree from the University of London, brought a sense of self-worth to his people. Former Industry and Justice Minister Kendrick Raddix, who narrowly escaped his own death that fateful day, can best describe the powerful influence of Maurice Bishop. Because he was a person who needed to have a spirit of camaraderie around and that he got on with everybody. He could not, he was not a petty man, malicious, spiteful, conspiratorial or anything like that. He was a whole person. Six days after being placed under house arrest, Bishop, along with three of his top cabinet ministers and two union supporters, were gunned down by renegade leftist radicals. When, they, when Bishop was killed on October 19th, to me, the entire country wept, and also the world, because they did not kill a Grenadian, but they killed a world leader. Oh, no, they shouldn't kill Bishop, so, oh, no. They shouldn't kill Bishop, so he was a righteous man. Oh, no. they kill Bishop, so he was a loving oh, man. No. They kill Bishop, so he was a true oh, man. No. They kill Bishop, so he was a righteous oh, man. No. They kill Bishop, so oh, oh, no. They kill Bishop, so At the Grand Ants and True Blue College campuses, 800 medical students were unaware that nearby a virtual bloodbath had occurred. The tragic events of Bloody Wednesday would plunge the students and the 200 other Americans living on the island into a struggle for their own survival. A fleet of 21 U.S. warships were diverted from their original destination of Lebanon as fear ran high that Americans could be seized and taken hostage. In the early dawn of October 21st, the nearby island of Barbados was made the command center 
and the U.S. forces began the necessary preparations for the impending battle. C-5 transporters were unloaded, dispatching the Army's powerful AH-1 Cobra attack helicopters. The C-5s would later play a major part in the rescue of the American medical students who now waited anxiously, unsure of the outcome in this ordeal of terror. With only two days to prepare their strategy, tensions ran high among the highly trained and efficient military personnel. The primary objective of the U.S. forces was to guarantee that Havana and Moscow could not further extend their power into the Caribbean and to ensure that this tiny nation would never become a Marxist puppet. The leftist rebels on Grenada would soon know the imposing power of one of the military's battle-proven technological achievements, the AC-130 Spectre gunship. During an impeccable performance of avoiding enemy anti-aircraft fire, the Spectre would rain a storm of bullets down onto enemy positions, severely crippling Fidel Castro's mercenaries. Two days later, the invasion began. As part of a three-prong attack, the objective of the Navy SEALs would be to secure the governor's mansion, which had been taken over by revolutionary forces in the capital city of St. George's. Equipped and ready, the 82nd Army Airborne Rangers, based out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, prepared for takeoff from the command center in Barbados, also determined that this would be a swift victory. It was up to the Rangers to overpower the military regime that had issued orders to kill any violators of the round-the-clock curfew. Once behind enemy lines, the Navy SEALs stealthily crept past opposing forces and potential sniper attacks. In the humid 100-degree heat of the tropical isle, sweat soaking through the layers of their camouflage uniforms, the SEALs' endurance was truly tested. Their mission, to rescue Governor General Sir Paul Schoon, Queen Elizabeth's representative, who had been put under house arrest by the rebels. Little did the SEALs know the great peril that awaited them at the Governor's Hilltop Mansion overlooking St. George's Harbor. Three Cuban-manned BTR-60 armored personnel carriers would pin them down, trapping them for the next 21 hours. By the end of that time, 10 of the 11 SEALs would be wounded. Aboard the USS Guam, the Marines were ready for action. 400 from the amphibious ready group I-84 were about to deploy armed helicopters to Grenada's airport at Pearls. Pilots waited tensely for clearance. Each takeoff had to be choreographed with precision as chopper after chopper ventured into the crowded skies above. The able ground crew endured a deafening cacophony of sound to ready the mighty airships. In a race against time, it was imperative that the Marines take control of Pearls Airport. Located on the East Coast, it was Grenada's only working commercial airstrip. A victory here would equal the first American stronghold. Marines powered forcefully into the area. Helicopters blazed across the sky and stormed the tiny beach, ready to engage a bitter struggle for control of the airfield.
Marines waited anxiously for orders detailing their next move. Within two hours, the Marines secured the airfield, encountering only a weak ragtag force of Grenadian Army troops and ineffectual Cuban fighters. Thanks to the highly honed skills of the illustrious Marines, this phase of Operation Urgent Fury went exactly according to plan. Aboard the C-130 transport planes, 500 Army Rangers prepared for their destination, Point Salinas. No one knew the real strength of the Grenadian Army. This could be a tougher fight than expected. Grenada was teeming with Cubans and Soviets. If the operation took longer than anticipated, American lives could be in severe jeopardy. As the transport planes approached Point Salinas, the Army Rangers found themselves in a storm of anti-aircraft and machine gun fire. This forced the Rangers to parachute from a dangerously low height of 500 feet, giving the jumpers only 19 seconds before their perilous landing. An excellent example of the Army Rangers' superb training. As the Rangers dropped to their destination, their parachutes were riddled with bullets from the Cuban forces. It was imperative that the Army Rangers take control of Point Salinas, where only yards away lay the True Blue campus and several hundred terrified medical students. To avoid heavy casualties, the Americans called in their impressive offshore air power. The UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters raced in to rotate the troops. Fit and alert soldiers replaced the returning combat weary. While on the other side of the island, Cobra attack helicopters were dispatched to assist in the capture of over 250 Cubans. In this phase of Operation Urgent Fury, the forces met with its greatest number of casualties. 11 American lives were lost. Currently under construction, Point Salinas was a highly controversial 9,000-foot airstrip. The U.S. feared that the Cubans were building this as a military base. From Point Salinas, communist aircraft would have easy access to the neighboring South American countries. At Point Salinas, Americans garnered another important victory as they took control and established a command post for the invading forces. Grenada's neighboring island nations of Antigua, Barbados, Dominica, Jamaica, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent gladly cooperated by taking up routine police duties, patrolling harbors and checkpoints. With both coasts now under U.S. control, Pearl's Airport on the east and Point Salinas on the south, the Allied forces could regroup knowing that their efforts against the revolutionaries had been exceptional. Welcome back. Hell of a job. Shaking hands with a real pro. Oh, Good to have you here. Still further strategy had to be planned. Now that the True Blue campus was safe, 224 more medical students at the Grand Anne's campus, four miles away, waited for rescue, almost out of food and surrounded by the enemy. 
Their only communication with the outside world was a student ham radio operator keeping listeners throughout the hemisphere informed that his campus was still cut off from U.S. forces. Uh, we think they're getting pretty hungry, and they're, a lot of them probably thinking about coming in, but they haven't done that yet. The wounded were transported aboard C-130s to makeshift field hospitals. Spirits were high among the 91 injured, most suffering from only minor wounds. At the True Blue campus, grateful medical students volunteered tearing up bed sheets for bandages and rearranging library tables to receive incoming patients, while other students waited anxiously for the arrival of the military. Rangers and paratroopers marched on to True Blue campus to aid in the airlift of the first American medical students. As Cuban prisoners, silent and sworn to secrecy, nervously awaited transport back to Havana, their fate was unclear since their own leader, Fidel Castro, had denied access to Cuba by any prisoner of war, living or dead. Castro did not want the Cuban people to witness the human casualties of his military disasters. The Army Airborne fired a battery of 105 millimeter howitzers into the enemy encampments, allowing troops to begin inching up north to the Grand Anse campus, four miles away. The evacuation of medical students at True Blue would look easy in comparison with the operation at Grand Anse. Last minute orders from the command center would dispatch amphibious vehicles from the coast to leapfrog rangers and paratroopers over the Cuban positions. Sweltering under the severe afternoon heat and the weight of 50-pound packs, Marines had to push forward to Grand Mall Beach to aid the Navy SEALs, now under siege at the Colonial Mansion at St. George's. Utilizing their helicopter gunships, landing craft, and tanks, the Marines fought their way into enemy territory from the sea. Meanwhile, as an all-out air attack was waged at Grand Anse, additional forces were needed. Launching from the USS Independence, A-6 intruders and A-7 Corsair attack jets joined in the skirmish. In a devastating aerial bombardment that lasted only 15 minutes, the nearby enemy-occupied Spice Island and Grenada Beach hotels were completely leveled. At the same time, Admiral Joseph Metcalf III, the U.S. Force Commander for the Invasion, ordered the redeployment of the Marines at Pearls Airport to join the troops already at Grand Mall Beach. As Marines patrolled through the countryside, evidence of a Soviet intervention became clear. Aside from captured tanks, a large cache of Cuban and Soviet weapons is uncovered, including AK-47 rifles, 120 millimeter mortars, machine guns, anti-aircraft weapons, rocket launchers, rifles, and handguns. Enough arms to equip two Cuban battalions for up to 45 days of combat. As Army Rangers neared Grand Anse, the threat of sniper attacks remained clear. The snipers, usually members of the Grenadian and Cuban armies, wore civilian clothes, hiding their pistols and automatic weapons as they walked. They easily blended in with the local population. Some, however, carried more lethal weapons. The 
Go ahead. Oh. What happened here? Okay, as you can see, it's a Jeep that belonged to one of the first infantry units that came in here. And from uh, the position right down the street, one of the Cubans hit it with a grenade launcher, and you can see how it exploded, and there's not too much left of it. The effects of the war were becoming costly to the Cubans in the Grenadian Army. More prisoners were captured, some mere children. Before the U.S. troops could reach the Grand Anse campus, they ran into fierce firefights in the city of Frequente. Heavy losses were felt by the enemy as the Americans seized their weaponry and equipment, including the Soviet BTR-60 armored personnel carriers. Hour after hour, the enemy would radio Havana, begging to surrender. The message from Fidel Castro was always the same. For the glory of the revolution, no. But any glory of this revolution would be undermined by the loss of human lives. Finally reaching the colonial mansion, Marines rushed in to rescue the Navy SEALs. Other battle-weary but triumphant Marines secured the streets of St. George's. The Army Rangers, aided by the Marines, were successful in their ambush of the Northern Hills. The troops reached the campus of Grand Anse and freed the remaining medical students. While American soldiers were hailed heroes in the streets of St. George's, captured Cubans retreated to their homeland in shame, afraid to face the wrath of Fidel Castro. A devastated Castro greeted his returning troops in staunch silence. Operation Urgent Fury had dealt him the greatest blow since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Tell Mr. Reagan, all Grenadians are happy to know that he took this step in time to save our lives. And may God bless him. God bless the people. Good, good, good. After the complete success of Operation Urgent Fury, the forces returned victoriously to their U.S. military bases, their mission fulfilled. Performing under the most extreme conditions, the U.S. Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force, in conjunction with the multinational forces, displayed an exemplary performance in combat and military strategy, saving the lives of thousands and restoring order to a war-torn country. Thanks to the swift American and Allied intervention, life on the friendly island of Grenada could now return to its former days of tranquility and peace. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.